So, uh, hi everyone. For those of you that hi. don't know me, my name is Damian. Uh, I'm part of Infinum and uh, welcome to our new office in Skopje. So today it will be my pleasure to welcome you to the first of hopefully many Infinum talks that uh, we'll uh, hold in this office. And uh, today our goal is to uh, talk about uh, Viper and Combine, which is uh, the answer to our joke question, what the snakes and harvesters have in common. And please don't feel obliged to laugh at our jokes. They're not very good. Um, also, I would like to introduce my colleague uh, Kreshimir, who also worked on this presentation. But uh, unfortunately, he's ill, and he wasn't able to come today. But I think that you'll be able to meet him in uh, some of our uh, next uh, Infinite Talks. So to start off, um, I would like to introduce you to the reason why we chose to use Viper. So um, as many of you probably know, if you come from a developer background, is that there's always a bunch of these architectures floating around, uh, MVC, MVVM, Viper among them, MVP, and many more. And um, Apple suggested that we start using MVC. So uh, being the good boys and girls that we are, we said, OK, we'll use MVC and see how that works out. Um, I'll just give a quick overview of that MVC architecture. So. As you may know, we have a model, a view, and a controller. The controller sits nicely in the middle and takes care of most of the work. Uh, and uh, as you can imagine, this uh, becomes uh, problematic uh, pretty quickly. And now we come to Apple's version of NC, which is somehow even worse. Uh, they suggest uh, squashing the view and the controller into almost a single uh, component. And they're very, very, very tightly uh, coupled together, which, of course, makes the problem even bigger. And this is where the infamous MVC massive view controller jokes comes from. Uh, I think that most of you have encountered that uh, yourselves. Uh, but however, we managed to work this into our projects and uh, find some uh, solutions, uh, some, some hacks, some workarounds. Uh, we did some uh, proper code separation, separation of concerns, dependency injection, and we managed to get this to work to an acceptable degree. And of course, there are many apps that only use MVC to this day, and they work perfectly fine. So that's all good. So we solved our problem. So what's the problem then? Like, uh, where's the issue? Why, why move to Viper? Well, the issue began when we started growing. And when we started growing our teams, as the teams grew larger, so did our problems. Um, which, is, which is to be expected, because when you have a larger team, you have a larger amount of people from different backgrounds, different skill sets. They, uh, they have a different proficiency, a different way of doing things. And so uh, in time, the code starts becoming messy. We can take a look at two examples. So for example, the junior developers, or people who are not as proficient, try to be faster and efficient as they imagine their more senior colleagues to be. And the result of this is that a lot of code end up, ends up in these uh, massive controllers, uh, which is also not good. And on the other hand, we have the senior developers who are sometimes even worse. They tend to create uh, their own mini patterns and architectures and try to force them on everyone, uh, which uh, doesn't actually help the problem. It just, it just makes, it, makes it worse in some cases. So, the result of this is that things become inconsistent, and the architecture itself, MVC, makes it hard to, uh, for us to um, uh, build, build in some consistency, uh, because it only has three components, and two of them, like we saw, are closely coupled, so there's not a lot you can do there for a larger team. And also, if you need to switch projects, if you need to maintain older projects, uh, having no consistency makes it uh, pretty, pretty hard. So in comes Viper. Um, for those of you that don't know, Viper is an acronym of View, Interactor, Presenter, Entity, and Router. Um, and I will now quickly introduce you to how we came to the conclusion that we're supposed to use Viper. And then we'll get a bit more into the details. So our thinking was, OK, what do we need? We need an architecture that provides easier maintenance or familiarity between code bases. Uh, we need to be able to uh, reuse existing code within a project and between uh, different projects. 
We also need a code that's testable or that you can make testable pretty easily. And we also need our architecture to yield uh, cleaner code uh, at the end. So we thought that Viper fit this purpose properly. Why? Because it's inspired by clean architecture. Uh, because it has modules which uh, revolve around use cases, uh, which fits our needs. And because it's already adapted for mobile devices, so that's a plus as well. Here we have a quick overview of uh, what the basic Viper architecture looks like, uh, bearing in mind that we've replaced one of the letters. And the R for router became wireframe, a W for wireframe in our implementation because it fits our IS development better. So as you can see, we have all of the other letters from the, from the acronym here. And I, I will uh, go into a bit detail uh, one by one. First of all, we have the entity, which is located to the rightmost side of this, of this diagram. And this, the entities are supposed to be these uh, self-contained uh, pieces of code, which co code some domain logic, which um, should be and is, is properly, uh, if you set it up properly, it's going to be separated from the rest of the Viper module. Uh, why is that? It's because we need these entities to be reusable. We need to be able to switch them around, give them to someone else, put them in another project, use them in another Viper module, and that's why we need them to be independent, and using this architecture, they can be. Uh, a simple example of uh, some entities would be some uh, API services, like all of you use in your day-to-day -day work, we would group them into several different entities. And who is in charge of um, consuming those entities? Well, that's the next one, the next component, that's the interactor. As you can see, the interactor sits right next to the entities, and he's the only one, it's the only one that knows about them. And it's his job, his job to uh, leverage the data that the entities provide and prepare it for use further along in the, in the Viper module. Uh, a simple example of an interactor would look something like this. I mean, it's interface. It has some function which fetches users from some API, and it, result, it uh, returns as a result a list of those users or an error if an error happens, which you can then handle further on in the Viper module. Moving on to the wireframe part, or the R, which stands for router, uh, as you can see, we are moving around the presenter, which is kind of the, the main villain here. So we are going to cover all of these before we get to the presenter. Uh, the wireframe is the part of the uh, Viper module which takes care of all navigation. So if you imagine a standard MVC architecture, all of that code that you put in the view controller which handles segways, uh, popping, presenting, pushing uh, view controllers, all of that is now removed and it goes to the wireframe. And the wireframe is also the one that handles dependency injection. Why is that? Well, it's simply because if you put multiple Viper modules next to each other, they all communicate through their wireframes. And it's the obvious entry point for dependency injection into a, a given module. Uh, we can see a simple example of some wireframe interface which has some function, let's say, to open user details for some user ID. That's as simple as that. Moving on to the view. The view is this leftmost part of the uh, diagram. Uh, the view is dumb, <laughs> like we uh, like to say. It's basically a UAV controller, uh, UAV subclass. And it has an important responsibility, which is to take the data from the presenter which, it, which it, it is given from the presenter and show it to the users and also respond to some user action in that view and pass that action along to the presenter so that the presenter can react uh, accordingly. This is uh, a simple example of a view interface. This view has functions which allow it to be populated with some title and subtitle and another function which allows some list into it to be populated with um, uh, some items, hypothetically. Uh, and now we get to the presenter. Like I said, the main part of the, of the module, uh, it sits neatly in the middle, and it's, it's kind of the glue that holds this whole thing together. Um, it, it's, its job is to update the view. Its job is also to talk to the wireframe. 
when you need to navigate somewhere, and its job is to request updates of data from the interactor. Here's a simple example of an interface for a presenter. So it has these two events, host selected and event selected. And if you can imagine the view from the previous slide, the view would react to some button action and call one of these methods, and then the presenter handles it. So this is all well. Then we started using it, implemented it in our existing projects. We started uh, using it in new projects. And then we realized that Viper is not so perfect. The Viper beat us back. So what happened? Well, when we started uh, molding it into our, um, our, our use case, we figured out that there are several problems that we need to address. First of all, the problem of which of the Viper components is kind of the, the owner of the whole thing, and also which Viper component takes care of which part of the, of the job. So there was a lot of trial and error. We tried different things. We broke a lot of things, then we fixed them, and we broke them again, and so on, until we came to this uh, conclusion that we would have these sort of relationships between the Viper components. So the full, uh, the full line arrows that you see are strong references. The dashed lines are the weak references. And as you can see uh, from this diagram, you see no full line closing a circle, which is good. We have no strong uh, cycles that will break our app. And um, uh, what's also nice is that the view holds a strong reference to the other strong references, which means that because we work with mobile apps and the view is kind of the, the main thing that uh, the navigation through the app happens on, uh, when a view is dismissed, deallocated, popped, or otherwise destroyed, that means that everything else is neatly destroyed and released. So we have nothing in memory. Everything is cleaned up. And the end result is uh, pretty, pretty stable. So that's great. But then we also came to this problem, which is that it takes a lot of files just to set up uh, a Viper module. As you can imagine, we have all these files. Uh, add some uh, helper files around that. And you can see how this becomes messy very quickly. So. We need a lot of files to get things going. And we need some boilerplate code in all of those files because they need to fit the Viper architecture. So that, that became a problem very quickly. So some of our smart boys and girls sat down and created the Viper generator, which is an open source project available on GitHub. You can check it out on, the, on our account on GitHub. Uh, and you can use it freely as you wish, or even you know, modify it. Um, open pull requests or contribute in any way you see fit. What does the Viper generator do? Well, it solves the problems from the previous slide. It creates all of the files for us if we wanted to. So this is the Viper module, for example. This is another one. As you can see, it creates all of the files with the same naming, so you don't need to get, take care of that either. And also, it can create a whole Xcode project for you with this built in. So it can, if you're starting a new project, it can create a whole Xcode project with all of the base Viper classes uh, built in, and the boilerplate code that I mentioned is already in those classes, and you just subclass them. And that way, it's uh, even faster to set up a new project to, to run on Viper. So that's, uh, this is how uh, interface generated from our Viper generator looks like. And you may be asking, what's the interface now? It wasn't part of the acronym. Well, if you see here, we have the five letters, the four letters, and we also have the five letters, and we also have the interfaces file. Why do we have the interfaces file? Well, because we somehow need to uh, define the functionality of all of those components in one place and see how they how they work with one another. This is an example of how such an interface file looks after you've set it up. So as you can see, we can quickly see what each uh, component can do and how they work with one another. So as you can imagine, the, the view would call this function when the pay button is pressed. The interactor has the get details, which the presenter calls, and so on and so forth. So really simple, and it works very nicely for us. And also, this uh, layout, like one header file, is very reminiscent of Objective-C for those who have worked in it. It looks a lot like a .h file, which is kind of familiar to us. So that works well as well. So in conclusion, we are now happy with Viper the way we have it. 
We use it in all of our projects, and uh, we are not uh, strictly enforcing it, but it's the main architecture that we built uh, our projects on. Uh, and of course, it keeps evolving, and, uh, but that's, that's, that's part of the, of the job. So I hear you asking, what about those harvesters that we mentioned in that hilarious joke? Well, the harvester in the joke is the combine. Uh, what's, what's combine? Combine is Apple's uh, reactive framework which is an answer to Rx Swift, which used to exist before it. It still exists. They coexist now. Uh, I'm not going to say that they ripped them off, but they kind of ripped them off. Uh, why did we move towards a reactive paradigm? Well, because we saw that even though we've kind of worked through Viper, there are still some problems that you cannot exactly explicitly address. And such problem is, uh, for example, states. So as you can imagine, in this Viper architecture, you need to pass around some states which get mutated and then those updates need to propagate. So that becomes messy and it, it kind of moves the responsibility to the developers too much to take care of everything, which of course we're not perfect and sometimes we break things. So we said, okay, what will fix our problem? Perhaps some reactive paradigm. Initially, that was Rx Swift. It worked really well for us. We still use it today, but we're now slowly moving towards combine, which is pretty much the, the same thing. Uh, of course, we needed to change up our Viper uh, architecture a bit to fit the uh, reactive paradigm. Not much happened. Basically, we changed those plain functions that you saw in that interface file. We squashed some of them into a single binding, which actually connects the presenter and the, and the view. And that's why the, the interface was changed. So if we used to have uh, separate functions in the presenter and the view interface to do the bidirectional binding. Now we do it in this single function, which is called, usually we call it configure, and we have this view output and view input uh, structures that uh, handle the binding. And I will show them to you in detail uh, so that you can understand better how it works, but that will be a bit later. So the general idea still stays similar as before we implemented Combine, when it was non-reactive. But the views now send events via publishers. Uh, the presenter formats the data using publisher operators. And the view sends and receives this data through the view output and view input structs, uh, which are used in the binding that I already mentioned. How does that view look now? Well, the view now uh, has publishers, which needs to be sent through the view output. It needs to hold a set of any cancelables, which need to be released and, and deallocated. And uh, we have the same concept because the view is the, the, the main player. Once you go back, everything is deallocated, all of it is cleaned up. And that also has the added benefit of enabling us to use unknown enclosures safely without fearing a crash, uh, because we know that uh, uh, we won't cause a crash uh, using this, uh, this flow. Here's an example of how a view module would look with uh, Viper and Combine. As you can see at the top, we have the cancelables set, which, uh, where we store all of the cancelables, which get deallocated at the end. And right at the start, in view it load, we call the setup uh, view function, which will actually do the binding. So this is the binding that I'm mentioning. We, separate, uh, we prepare some view output, and we get a view input from that output, and then we can handle the input and the output in their appropriate places. The input is handled here. So in this case, we have some imaginary handle function, which um, takes the items from that input and probably puts them in a list or something. And the other way, we send the tab publisher from some button as a button action. We'll see that in the presenter in a bit. So in the presenter, pretty much the same changes, except that publishers need to be sent back with the view input, so the other way. We also keep the set of cancelables separately. And we also have the added benefit of unowned enclosures being safe to use. This presenter now leverages the interactor to fetch data, which it then uses to populate the view once the data is arrived, or to provide some error handling, formatting, or whatever else is needed. This is how one of those presenters would look like with Combine. So again, we had the cancelables up top. And here is that almighty configure function that, that we keep mentioning. Uh, we have a handle function again to handle the button action that's done here. In this 
closure in the sink is where we would probably do something triggered by that action. And in the rest of the configure function, we see the fetching of the items from the interactor and passing them via the view input back into the view. So what are these view output and view input that we keep mentioning? Well, they are really, really simple structures which just allowed us to group uh, these, uh, these bindings better. And they have the added benefit of uh, providing a very short and concise info about what the modules do and how they communicate with each other, or rather the components in the module. This is how they look like. So we have a view output and a view input struct uh, from the previous example carrying on. One has the button action and the other has the items. And that's, that's pretty much what happens in this imaginary module. It has one action going this way and it has items going that way. Uh, so as you can see, pretty simple and easy to, to get going and, uh, and understand. So in conclusion, uh, we continue to use Viper and Combine in most of our projects. Uh, we tend to not force the usage where it's not fit for the purpose. And we always keep evolving and iterating on this. Even the generators are updated. And uh, we, we, we would like to continue doing that. And we would like, we would be very happy if uh, some or even all of you contributed to this uh, architecture so that, uh, yeah, it, it, so that it can continue growing and, and evolving. And it's not, it's not forever. If we, if we find out some other architecture fits our purposes better in the, in the future, we'll have another infinite talks for you and uh, talk about that then. So I would like to thank you for, for your attention. And uh, please stay in touch. Feel free to contact us on our email addresses or on the GitHub repositories or whenever you see our names. And uh, we'll be happy to, to talk with you. Thank you very much. Uh, so now if you, if you have any questions, Myself and our dear Mr. Philip Gulan, who is uh, head of mobile, will be happy to address them for you uh, if there's any. And please feel free. Yeah, don't, don't, don't be shy. Yeah, the next lecture will be about Android or more Android specific uh, architecture and uh, you'll, you'll hear from, from these guys as well. Okay, if there are no more questions, uh, would you like us to have a break if uh, you need it for five or ten minutes or would you like us to continue? We can do a break. We can do a break? Okay, ten minutes, is that enough? Yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you very much.